When the 3 million Axis troops marched into the abyss of the Soviet Union in the biggest invasion in human history in 1941, victory was always going to be a big ask. The sheer vastness of Russia itself makes it the hardest major power in Europe to conquer by a landslide. It was always going to be a war to the death. Whilst there were times during the war when peace feelings were extended from both sides at various times, they never came close to serious fruition and Hitler banned Ribbentrop from pushing the peace offers further when they arose. If you're going to go all in on destroying the Soviet Union, you need all the help you can get. You can never have enough allies. Germany, Finland, Romania, Slovakia, Hungary and Italy all together still doesn't leave you with the best of chances. Even with all of the foreign SS volunteers later on, you're still looking at a near impossible task. In my eyes, there was only ever one golden ticket to victory against the Soviets the citizens of the Soviet Union themselves. From the very beginning, the Soviet Union was the most hated state on planet Earth, a pariah state. They reneged on all their foreign debts and their goal was a complete world revolution to install their ideology. So in effect, a direct threat to every country on planet Earth. Churchill advised crushing communism as soon as it was born. The fact that the Soviet Union even still remained after the bloodbath of its birth is a feat in itself. Crushed in from all sides, Japanese, British, Americans, Germans, Latvians, Estonians, Poles, white Russians, the list goes on. Somehow, they survived. Millions had died. The promise of a communist utopia revealed as a lie. The Orthodox Church was looted and the priests massacred. Christians across the world looked on in horror as the atheist superstate grew in power. For years afterwards, starvation was rampant. When Stalin came to power, it somehow got even worse. The Ukrainian people suffered most. Forced starvation due to insane collectivist farming laws resulted in the deaths of as low as 3.5 million to as high as 10 million people. This was called the Holodomor. If it's towards the tail end of that number, you're looking at potentially the biggest genocide in European history. Due to a massively inflated percentage of the Soviet commissars enforcing the atrocities being Jewish, anti-Semitism was rife all through Eastern Europe. When the Soviet Union reclaimed the Baltic states in 1940, a wave of unimaginable horror immediately hit the people. Thousands of people were shipped off to Siberia for the tiniest of reasons, whether that be an opinion they held, their job, or whatever it may be. Once sent into the vastness of the East, most were never seen again. The pain is still felt today in the Baltics. They never forgot. Even the president of Latvia, Carlos Ulmanis, was shipped off and died in the middle of nowhere in the Turkmenistani steppe. Thousands more were shot dead immediately, whether that be in the street or an NKVD basement. Western Europe was horrified by what they saw and had seen in the past. Even occupation by the Germans in the West paled in comparison to the horrors that would befall the local population if Europe were ever to be overrun by communism. There was no shortage of men who would be willing to take up arms against the so-called Red Menace. All that is to say, if the Nazis needed allies to take down the Soviet regime, they certainly weren't going to be short of volunteers. When the Germans and their allies marched into Ukraine, the Baltics, and even parts of Russia itself, they were greeted as liberators. Many would have joined forces willingly the second they could. Millions of Soviet soldiers would have defected to the German side, if given the opportunity, and an even remote vision of what their future might look like. Unfortunately, this wasn't to be. A solid plan on what to do with the population was not made beforehand, and German policy was all over the place as they marched in. The way the Germans treated the locals was incredibly mixed. The millions of disaffected Soviet citizens who wanted independence for their respective countries if the Soviet Union was to fall were only given vague ideas of what lay in store for them in the future. Hardly the most confidence-inspiring policy ever. The same was true in the West. The Germans weren't sure, for example, whether to incorporate the Netherlands into the Reich due to their historic cultural similarities or to restore some degree of independence under the leadership of Dutch National Socialist Anton Mosset whom they didn't yet trust. There wasn't much trust to go around at all, and that appeared to be the main issue. Alfred Rosenberg, a Baltic German himself, born in Estonia, and the most knowledgeable of the Nazis regarding the Eastern Europeans, begged Hitler to cooperate more and offer the people of the East a more clear vision of their future. But Hitler, by this point, wasn't very trusting to anyone, not even those closest to him. Several attempts were made on his life, and he didn't even trust his own generals. So to put his trust in some Eastern Europeans he knew nothing about, was a stretch too far for Hitler. Eventually, Hitler allowed Himmler to recruit for dozens of foreign SS units. Some of the most notable are the Walloon Legion led by the famous Leon de Grau, the Latvian Legion whom had the most recruits of any, the Viking Division consisting of various North Europeans, the French Charlemagne Division, and many more. Even a British Legion was attempted, albeit not with much interest. In the end, over 500,000 foreigners, or ethnic Germans from outside Germany, the Volksdeutsch, were recruited to fight in Hitler's crusade against the Soviet Union. This was but a fraction of what could have been achieved if the various peoples were given more to go on. If the Ukrainians had been offered a Ukrainian state after the war, no matter with how much autonomy they'd have to give up to Germany during and after the war, millions of highly motivated men would have jumped at the chance. Anything was better than Soviet domination again. The Baltic peoples were extremely eager to fight the Soviets even without being given a promise of their future. With a solid plan for some form of independence or autonomy in the future, 
you're looking at even more soldiers. Hundreds of thousands in the West would have happily gone on crusade if it meant their nation had a brighter future because of it. Much like de Grel and his Walloon soldiers did, one of the few non-Germans that Hitler was to trust. Many Russians were just as disgusted with the Soviet regime as the minorities of their Soviet superstate were. Thousands of Germans joined General Vlasov in changing over to the German side, and out of the millions of Russians who had surrendered throughout the war, this was simply due to their hatred of Joseph Stalin and his sick regime. They did not care to fight to the end for such a man. Many had lost family members or friends to Stalin's purges and genocide. Instead of utilising this almost unlimited pool of manpower, on the whole, the Germans treated their prisoners like dirt. Hitler's lack of trust is understandable, but to not even make the slightest compromise seriously hindered his war effort. If a proper system was set up to find trustworthy men and send them to die fighting against the communist menace, why not? The German-Soviet war could quite easily have turned into a second Russian civil war, with Adolf Hitler ultimately at the head of it, able to form whatever German-friendly Russian state he wanted at the end of it, no matter how reduced in territory. Many would have accepted the trade-off and fought for Hitler, simply to be rid of communism. Many former white Russian generals from the civil war in fact did join up and fight in Hitler's crusade, no matter how vague the view of their future was. If they were given more faith, resources, and men, their efforts would have been much more effective. Instead, for their meagre contribution to Hitler's war in the hope of a better future for their people, they were handed over by the Allies to Stalin at the end of the war and executed in one of the most disgusting Allied acts of the war. The same Allies who had funded them in the first civil war and betrayed them then, now betrayed them for a second and final time. The Russian people who wanted to overthrow Stalin truly had no one to trust with their future and no means to do it by themselves. In the end, Hitler lost, and Eastern Europe, and half of his own country, or what was left of it, was thrown under brutal communist rule for almost half a century. The sheer size of the Soviet forces, many of whom would have happily fought for Hitler nearer the start of the war in the hope of a better future, swamped Europe. The German army and the foreign SS recruits simply did not have the manpower to compete with the Soviet hordes. I find it hard to imagine that the outcome would have remained the same if even a few larger Eastern nations had been offered a more nominal independence, never mind the Western nations, especially if the Russian people themselves had been offered an alternative. It's extremely understandable where Hitler had so little faith in others, but if only he'd had a little more, the outcome may have been radically different.